the common Welcome to this uh, interview session of the Remix the Commons. Uh, so first we would like you to present yourself uh, and to explain what you do in relation to open hardware. Uh, so Jeremy, why, why don't you start? Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, well, I am a free software developer uh, known as Yaromil online. And uh, for me, open hardware is uh, um, a dream that slowly comes true, I hope. I used to develop operating systems um, uh, an operating system like Dynabolic and one of the best things that ever happened to us was that uh, um, it could run on an Xbox game console. So you can imagine how many game consoles are around the world and these uh, they are not just gaming uh, platforms, they are an infrastructure, an actual infrastructure that is present even in the most remote towns of uh, Indonesia I've seen sometimes like just an electricity cable just to connect some gaming device. And imagine we could use that infrastructure also for many other things, for uh, reaching out to the information and making people access the internet. So I think open hardware is um, yeah, something that we should really work on in order to make our, um, our infrastructure adaptable to needs and flexible and yeah. uh, generic. Okay, thank you. Um, Joe Justice, uh, you probably have one of the most spectacular uh, open hardware projects. So tell me who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Joe Justice, the team lead of Team Wikispeed from Seattle, Washington in the United States. Team Wikispeed is a open hardware company that's crowdsourced and crowdfunded. We're best known for an ultra-efficient car that we've designed and brought to market. We also work on housing solutions to help end involuntary homelessness and delivering uh, vaccines to areas where they're needed most. We iterate quickly to work on all types of social good projects it's all open, all open source, and it's all crowdfunded, collaborated, and then delivered to the market and made available. So not just ideas, but we then also deploy and make available everything that comes out of the project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna, it's your turn. Yeah. Hi, I'm Anna Seravalli, and I'm an interaction design researcher in Sweden. And I'm, in the last three years, I'm working with uh, setting up uh, makerspace uh, in Malmo together with a local NGO, the municipality and a research centre. And uh, my research is trying to understand how makerspaces, uh, makerspaces, fab labs and hackerspaces could become part of an infrastructure for an alternative production model based on open hardware and distributed production. Thank you. Smarri, what about you? Yeah, well, uh, I'm Smarri McCarthy. Uh, in about 2006-2007 I started to get involved with uh, the Fab Labs uh, as they were getting started and uh, brought the first Fab Lab to Iceland uh, and then started spreading them out there but also worked on Fab Labs in India and Afghanistan and a couple of other places. And uh, throughout all of that I was mostly interested in the aspect of uh, what happens when all of this works and you know we, we reach a tipping point how are we going to make sure that everybody has access to the knowledge they need to be able to use the devices in the most productive way possible so uh, that actually led me to uh, decouple from the fab labs and the hackerspaces movements a bit and focus on on just guaranteeing freedom of expression online because uh, it turns out that if you can't actually transmit the information then, then all the open hardware in the world isn't going to get you anywhere. So, uh, you know, I, I like the industrialist and, uh, or post-industrialist uh, kind of infrastructuralism, but, uh, but we, we need to take care of the fundamental rights as well, and, and so I'm, I'm spanning all of that area. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Uh, Chris, what about you? Cool. So I'm Chris Watkins. I work with Apropedia. Apropedia is a wiki for sustainable solutions, and the idea is that it's a platform for, for all manner of solutions around sustainability, dealing with hunger, creating an abundant and sustainable world, communities, lives. And yeah, so it's it's a very open approach, like enabling the, the knowledge sharing so it can be, you know, how to's, the, the detailed topical information, the, the analysis, the life cycle analysis, all of that. So in terms of open hardware, there's 
you know, a lot of designs, a lot of projects, uh, people, things that people have built. And the idea is that you can go there and find, you know, uh, design, how well it worked, problems with it, you know, variations on it, how it works in a particular context. Thank you. So I'll, I'll stay with you for a while. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to know now from all of you is the what are the obstacles that you're facing uh, in your project? So, mm -hmm. and and what are you looking for in terms of solutions? So maybe Chris, you can continue. I mean, the, the big challenge, and I mentioned this as a, a broad issue, talking about the commons, is that you have a very small proportion of people who actually contribute, who actually kind of go, oh yeah, you know, I, I know something, I, you know, I can fix that. There's a lot of people who have knowledge which is relevant to Acropedia, which is relevant to the, you know, renewable energy or housing design or uh, transport issues, whatever it is. And and people see that, but it's a it's a tiny fraction of a percent who will actually click edit and contribute to build that. So I mean that that's really requiring us to take a much more strategic uh, approach to say you know how do we get more university classes involved because it's when students from university classes get on and start creating assignments on there and and covering different topics that. That's what works. So we, we've got to get out and be more strategic that way. Okay, thank you, Samari. Well, so one of the things that uh, I find very uh, worrying in all of this is is the way in which most people take their infrastructure for granted and and don't realise that their infrastructure is very capable of killing them. Uh, this, you know, uh, in practice means that people are unaware of the chain of stuff that keeps them, uh, you know, uh, sheltered and warm and uh, not uh, dying of hunger and all of that stuff. And the unawareness of that contributes to a kind of more systematic unawareness of uh, of the power <coughs> relations, the, uh, the ways in which all of the infrastructure around us is being controlled by various parties. So when, uh, when you come with uh, the idea of hey, let's open up digital fabrication and allow everybody to make stuff and you know, put the tools into the hands of everybody, then some people go immediately, hey, yeah, that's going to be lots of fun, let's, uh, let's go and, and hack some stuff. But uh, on a broader societal level, everybody, you know, everybody else goes, yeah, well, I can just keep on watching TV instead. It's a lot easier and, lot, you know, and uh, I don't have any problems. And therefore, the, the kind of problems that we're going to be facing in the next couple of decades are being perpetuated by a lack of awareness of these issues. So one of the things I really want to do is make sure that we can communicate these things as effectively and, and you know, in as interesting a way as possible so that maybe more people can get on board and, and start looking at the, uh, the um, technologies that we need to develop as a, as a species and, and do more fun stuff, right? Okay, thank you. Um, I think there is um, one level, one issue which is related to um, what kind of model, what kind of possibilities is related to a fab lab and maker spaces and how they could become sustainable. And by sustainable, I don't mean just um, economically wise, but also how how do we keep in account, how do we understand production, not just the production of exchange value, but the production of also skills, uh, relationships, and news value. And now this can become an alternative to a production system which is just based on exchange value. And a second mission, I guess it's really connected to the one you have been brought up, and it's uh, what happened with Fabriken is that somehow um, it has allowed to create, become a space for, for discussion on a local scale about people who is really engaged with commons, people who don't care that much. And I think that's really, really the point, um, especially if we look production-wise, how can we create a commons, uh, in the sense, a space for discussion where we can engage with companies, uh, even with uh, corporations, and try to understand where do we go from here, because we have to face the fact that the actual production system, it's not, it's not sustainable anymore, it's not going uh, anywhere. And that's how, how can we create a space where we discuss together what the future of production is about. Okay, 
Thank you. Joe, um, um, maybe you can also focus on your answer on the funding issue, which I think is a problem for open hardware because the traditional industry lives from copyright, you know, from intellectual property mostly. Mm. And so it's not obvious to me that how, why they would fund um, open hardware projects, which basically don't allow these super profits. So can, can you elaborate a little bit on the financing issue and your ideas about that? When we focus on a meaningful and usable product each week, something that we can produce and people in society will, will care to use, it has an intrinsic value to them, we're able to organically self-fund. We're able to have something that's potentially shippable and purchasable each week. In our case, it's every Thursday. That's our sprint length um, using the Scrum sprint structure. That lets us fund ourselves early by not focusing on what's the five-year or six-year or, or even two-year or two-month delivery, but the one-week delivery, we're able to organically self-fund. And we've been able to work that way since 2006. What so does telling, slow us you, down... Are you telling me you're, you make a car in a week? or? Yes, we make new models of our cars every seven days. Wow. What does <laughs> slow us down is a, a lack of... Um, inexpensive testing infrastructure. We create tests for every parts of our cars and our other projects before we build them. That's the only way to move that fast safely. Now those tests typically in the market are very expensive so we have to first build our own tests and that takes time and it's worth doing and we learn a lot as it happens but when we find that someone else has made a test very inexpensive in terms of time and resources and, and, and currency, we're able to go much faster. So if, for example, someone took the side impact test, many countries have an equivalent of it. In the United States, it's an NHTSA uh, run test. If they made a simulation model of it as a web service, and they say, send us your CAD, and we'll send you back your simulated results of that impact test in an hour, and we'll charge you $10, which would be about right for the processing speed. That would make us much, much faster. Instead, we have to simulate and update that test ourselves because that infrastructure doesn't exist. If organizations and individual contributors took on making tests, safety tests, ergonomic tests, user value tests, uh, quick, easy, cheap to run, suddenly the pace of innovation is able to accelerate because then everybody knows if they've made a meaningful, workable contribution in a very short amount of time. Currently, we have to build all our own tests. Wow, okay. Um, sounds to me like you're taking on the whole world. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. In programming, there is this technique is called scaffolding, mm -hmm. when you have to construct units and put yeah. them into stress, let's say. So you have uh, that tool. So, so maybe before we go we to Jaramil, before we go to Jaramil, I, maybe something about regulation. Mm. How are you dealing with reg regulatory issues? Regulatory compliance is able to be met only with test-driven development. Before we start a project, we collect all the regulations that need to be met for that project to be usable and approved and have to create a test for each one of those. That takes some time, sometimes multiple weeks, you know, as we sprint through the list of all those regulations, just to be able to run a test that quickly lets us know if we're in compliance. Then we, then we start designing the fastest, cheapest, simplest thing that will pass all those tests. So regulatory issues uh, are, are able to be overcome at, at all by using test-driven development. And again, if those regulatory compliance issues were already phrased in tests, we'd be able to go much faster. But what uh, would the, is a regulatory framework a burden? I mean, uh, are, are a lot of these regulations uh, just pure awesome or are a lot of them just kind of very ad hoc and and kind of uh, working against your needs? I'm glad you asked. In the automotive space, most regulations are a net net value add. Okay. Most regulations add specific value to the consumer that the consumer wouldn't want to pass on if they had the choice. And most of them are phrased in terms of a test. Not all of them, but most of the time it's not you have to use this material, it has to be this thick. It says you need to be able to have an impact of this load not deform more than this dimension. Meaning we're able to, once we create a test fixture to run that test, have very innovative solutions 
They're compatible with innovation because they're phrased as tests. Mm -hmm. And then the tests themselves are uh, of a value that the customer or the user or the other people in the ecosystem of that product really care about. In general, they're a net value add. Okay, okay. And Charmel, your turn. Well, the challenge that uh, we have mostly, I mean, as software developers, uh, as free, open source, uh, or at least peer-reviewed software uh, development, is deploying it on hardware that is open enough. Therefore, the challenge is uh, the DRM, the Digital Restriction Management, um, that takes away rights from the users to actually adapt and, uh, and install on, on, uh, on objects, on uh, smart objects that we start having everywhere, uh, their own flavor, their own customization, or the one of their friends. So this is, uh, um, you know, it's a very actual and a hard uh, uh, issue. Uh, we can look at cases in which companies have understood actually the value of community development. One example is actually Cyanogen Mod, for instance, that is a modification of the Android uh, operating system, which Google initially uh, started to ban out of uh, um, and, and chase. Uh, and uh, finally understood that it was not a wise uh, option. And now, uh, basically, uh, users can, uh, can root their phone and install their own version of Android, which is, uh, you know, like, uh, there are nowadays, you can see, like, um, 14 years old or 16 years old uh, smart kids that are brewing their own uh, version of an operating system, which is a fantastic thing to see. You know, it's a it's a learning process and it's also an appropriation of, of the actual technology by the community. So I think uh, this is something that, luckily enough, uh, uh, there are many people uh, taking into account as a serious issue: the <laughs> digital restriction management, uh, uh, the anti. Uh, DRM campaign that, for instance, the Free Software Foundation is uh, promoting, and I hope that we uh, we will get more players into the field of hardware and software to understand the importance of this beyond the the, the purely commercial uh, financial uh, interest that moves uh, uh, industry to produce these things. Um, Smari, you had some concerns con around patent issues and copyright. Copyright? Can you? Well, your, your concern. Uh, so generally, I'm uh, I'm a, an abolitionist when it comes to patents. Patents uh, have uh, serve absolutely no purpose, uh, well, no beneficial purpose, shall we say, to the uh, to the markets and, and to the uh, people who are trying to innovate in them. They generally just uh, uh, they work as a deadweight loss in the economy. Uh, but on the other hand. Uh, a lot of the kind of open hardware and open source software, uh, open free software stuff, all of it is always predicated on the idea of uh, using copyright uh, uh, as a weapon in, a, in and of itself. So the copyleft mechanism, the uh, um, uh, so the uh, way of creating copyright licenses that uh, demand that uh, you know every user be granted the the right to use, study, share, and improve. This is all good. But at the same time, uh, there has never been such a thing for hardware uh, in the same way. Um, basically, hardware is not subject to copyright, although the designs are. Uh, hardware can be subject to patents, but patents don't have uh, this kind of conciliary mechanism that can be used uh, in, in these licensing terms. So uh, the question has to be, how do we uh, avoid uh, the closing of hardware that's been developed in a free and open way in the commons by companies that just want to um, uh, exploit it to their own gain without giving anything back, without any that reciprocity. Happened, uh, with a rep wrap, uh, these uh, 3D printing machines, didn't it? Yeah, it's, it's happened a number of times and uh, of course almost every single time this has happened so far uh, there's been a certain amount of blowback from the community of, of users uh, but at the same time, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. So when uh, one of the old car companies decides to take the wiki speed and, and just mass manufacture it, then you know uh, the only way of preventing that would be patenting. But patents are uh, you know they're just an evil that uh, that any uh, anybody who's working in the open hardware market is going to want to reject, right? So. You bring up a fantastic yeah. point, and I'd, I'd like to add some complimentary information. For example, if a major automotive manufacturer took the Wikispeed design, which is open, mm -hmm. and started mass manufacturing those vehicles, 
that would be completely awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. We wouldn't have to do it and we'd get ultra efficient cars out in mass. If someone else wants to do the work for <laughs> us, that's great. So we're a nonprofit. We right. specifically don't need to withhold information in order to profit. We're, we're around the goal of making the world a better place. And if we're able to make a reduction in CO2 and other emissions in urban areas by making our cars available in mass, and for that we have to be talking about quantities of tens of thousands, yeah. well, uh, anybody who wants to help is, is, is absolutely encouraged. That's oh, yeah. Awesome. But, but the, the question is, and you know, I, I absolutely agree, it would be wonderful right. if they were to mass manufacture. But what happens with the, with the improvements that they make on the design if they don't push those improvements back out into the commons? So if they close those up, then that's basically causing a, a certain disservice to the community. Right? That'd be called uh, bad profits, especially if we're looking in uh, Steve Dunning's angle yeah. of radical management things that frustrate the user but create a short-term gain, mm -hmm. and then typically erode market share over time and, and become a net loss over a certain time horizon, mm -hmm. which is usually less than, less yeah. than five years. Okay. Uh, I'd like to present my, you know, my, my dream. is basically that open hardware would lead to distributed manufacturing. First of all, to a world where you would have a network of micro factories that would make the material things very close to the people who need them and then therefore you know, save an enormous amount of um, uh, travel cost and, and energy cost. Um, and download the designs, the shared designs and then make things locally. Um, is, do you think that's a realistic vision? Uh, one more thing, I believe that when communities, you know, like, like your community Joe, when you design something you don't design for planned obsolescence, right? You design to make a really sustainable uh, product. And I don't know any open design community who that would do planned obsolescence. So do you share this optimistic vision? I like to be optimistic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so in, in that case, let's have a negative uh, mm -hmm. point and see how you react to that. What about a world where we have not just the democratization of the means of production of good things, but of bad things. For example, open source guns. So how do you see the possibility of a world where you know, almost anybody in his garage could produce um, open source guns? How, how do you react to that? A rock can maim someone just as easily. Well, maybe not just as easily, but is also capable <laughs> of being destruction. There's the famous saying, Smith and Wesson doesn't kill people people kill people. And if we still hold ourselves to ethical standards as a society, and if we still care about people and our mindset and care about our community and nurture folks who might be at risk of causing violence, it's not access to the means that solves the problem. Then they find another implement. It's helping nurture the community and helping care for people when tragedy does happen that's more important. Folks can already go out and make explosives from any range of kitchen or agricultural goods. They could take a rock. Any restaurant in, in the world is armed with all types of dangerous implements. And chemicals. And, and chemicals, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, if we look at the food preservatives, I, I'd venture to say that uh, more deaths are associated to items freely available in the grocery store that are labeled for human consumption than uh, are produced specifically as weapons. I, I'd imagine that's pretty close to true, if not dramatically, the majority uh, of truth. If we care about the people, the society, the mindset, and nurturing folks who are affected when it does happen, it's a much more effective means than attempting to regulate the production because attempting to regulate the production also precludes all other types of innovations right. that may be similar. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. The thing that I would add is, you know, what we, what we should be ta trying to do is not limit the production or limit the access to means of production, but rather to uh, to foster a society, create a society where people simply are not uh, incentivized to make weapons. And you know, the uh, the really, really like salient point is the difference between an ICBM and a space shuttle is what you put in the warhead. Mm -hmm. If you put people in a warhead, it's a space shuttle. If you put a bomb in a warhead, it's a bomb, right? 
so, you know, how do we get people to not make the weapon? Give them something better to do, mm -hmm. right? If we, you know, and then encourage them yeah. when they do. Be really happy that it happened yeah. and then use it if it's a meaningful yeah. solution. I mean, uh, it's easy to make weapons. It's very hard to make things which are not weapons. And maybe, you know, having a, a more innovative society, you know, a society where we actually, like, take the, the ideas of creating new things and venerate them and make them, you know, make them into the big stuff, you know, that's, that's the kind of community I'd like to live in. Well, with items like maker spaces and fab labs and hacker spaces, you do have a distributive means of idea, ideation, mm -hmm. idea creation, and then also manufacture. With repurposing and recycling of existing smart technologies, like an Xbox, and being able to make it, say, a microcontroller for robotic arm for those distributed manufacturing facilities, or an information conduit, or a test fixture, to help validate those ideas. That's now added recycling to the component and dramatically lowered the cost of significant processing power that has hardware input output and hardware remote interface. Then being able to create a wiki of what of those technologies come together to create this meaningful solution, the emergent property of distributed ideation and distributed manufacture. And don't forget the unicorns. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Uh, if may, I was uh, one thing. Um, when the talk is about democratizing of technology, and then it's just what we talk about is just access to information and to means of production. But I guess it requires also discussion about responsibility and a discussion about responsibility towards production, towards what we produce and change our way to relate uh, to things. So I think it's, it's really, really important to, it's not just about uh, giving people opportunity to do something funnier, but also giving people uh, the possibility to discuss what production is about and realize what kind of responsibility we have uh, in, uh, yeah, towards production system and what. Uh, we, we have to wrap up and I would like each of you and really thank you for this interesting conversation. I would like each of you to give a short definition of what is for you the commons. So maybe Chris, you can you can start. Oh, it's um, it's too big to sum up easily, but I mean, it's it's bringing together our collective energy to work on solutions that we need. Thank you. What, Smarry? Uh, it's a bit bad that it hasn't actually been properly defined, but I would say anything that comes out of uh, collective action and conversations between people uh, working together. So there's a certain togetherness that creates commons. Yeah, I would agree it's about togetherness, but then it's important who we, to discuss who is involved in this togetherness and, uh, and try really to open up for different uh, points of view and, and, and different positions. Uh, Chantal Mouffe, uh, she's a feminist uh, researcher, she used this idea of uh, agonistic uh, way of intending democracy, where you try to deal with opposite points of view uh, in order to create a common world. Thank you. The Commons is explicitly making it available for other people to build on your solutions and your resources to help make something in their mind and not creating any boundaries for that to happen. And that's completely awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Shana, well, <laughs> thank you, Michelle, for uh, all this and thank you, actually. I think uh, uh, Commons is about sharing, about being conscious of the abundance of sharing, of the act of sharing and also the abundance of trust at the base in a time in which we live, in which the trust to the top of the pyramid is really decaying very rapidly. We have to uh, stop being uh, grief and, and whining on, on what is the disaster that we are witnessing for them, which is not us, uh, to just think as the 99% and realize that we have a lot of trust flowing at the base and uh, on that we can uh, build something new. Thank you so much. This was an awesome uh, conversation, thank you. Uh, thank you. and thank you for pioneering, you know, all these uh, innovations for the world and for giving and sharing uh, your work. Thank, thank you, really. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Ha, ha, ha.